most of you now like, so that short kid is the one who plays the violin? Okay, all right. I, I don't usually get referred to as the kid who plays the violin, but thank you, PB. <laughs> How are you guys doing? How was your guys' Christmas? Are you guys doing good with Christmas? Good time? All right. I love, I love Christmas, and I love, I love these, these couple days, you know, in between Christmas and New Year's where nobody really knows what day it is. You don't know what you're doing tomorrow, and everybody, like, the time's up in the air. Most of the time, we're wearing our sweatpants and pajamas. I love the week in between Christmas and New Year's. It's, it's great, and, and I come from a really big family of, with five other siblings, and our favorite thing growing up, one of our favorite things was Christmas time. As you, as you can imagine, as young kids, we loved Christmas time. We love celebrating Christmas and having family over and giving and receiving. And as you can imagine, just a wonderful, wonderful time of year. And I know for me personally, it wasn't always Christmas Day that I loved most, but it was Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, because there's something about the anticipation of the next day, you know, the adrenaline that came, especially as a kid. You could not wait to open up the presents the next, next day, and then even still, we had all sorts of celebrations on Christmas Eve, and every year, we go to my aunt and uncle's house for Christmas Eve, where a whole family gets together, siblings, grandma, grandpa, aunts, uncles, everybody's there, and I, I remember one year in particular, we went to my aunt and uncle's house, and if you have kids, if you are a kid, you know the feeling of when do we get to open presents? When do we get to open presents? When is that time coming? When, when do we get to see what we got, what we've been wishing for for months? When do we get to open presents? And it finally got to that point of the night. It got to that point of the night, and my grandpa gets up, and he leaves the room. We're like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, this is it. He gets up and leaves the room, and he comes back, and he's got this massive, massive present in his hand filled, wrapped all around with wrapping paper, like, whoa, what is this? And we're pumped, we're amped up, we're ready to go. He brings it to my brother, John, and John with, can't even wait. He rips the paper right off the present, and underneath the wrapping paper is a brand new electric guitar, and we're like, let's go. We are pumped up. Usually, all we get for Christmas is like a few Dunkin' Donuts gift cards, and, and that's it. But now we're thinking, if John got an electric guitar, what could we have possibly gotten for Christmas? And we're ready to go. We cannot wait for him to get up, leave the room, and grab the next present for the next kid. And this is what he does. He gets up, he stands up, and he looks at the rest of us and says, since I decided to spend so much money on John this year, I decided not to get you guys anything, and he did not get us anything for Christmas that year, and we are like, what? Are you serious? Are you kidding me? The injustice of it. John loved it. He, even to this day, if you go out, and he's here today, if you mention that story to him, he'll give you the stupid little smug look on his face like, I got a guitar, you guys got nothing. And he still brags on us for this story because we got absolutely nothing. We had this entire list of things that we wanted, things we were waiting for months, and we got absolutely nothing. Just completely let down and disappointed. And sometimes I think with our spiritual walk and with our faith, sometimes we don't go to God. We don't ask for things from God because we are just too afraid to get let down. We don't want to face that disappointment. Or maybe even yet, yeah, if we ask God for something big and he doesn't give it to us, does that mean he's not even there? And some of us, we spend our entire lives living this way, and, and, and sometimes it gets to the point that if he doesn't show up, if he doesn't give us something that we're asking for, that we're pleading for, we feel like he's distant, like he's removed, or if he doesn't care, because if he did care, then he would be here. So there's this huge tension, and some of us spend our entire lives thinking that God is just distant from us, he's removed from us, he doesn't care, because if he cared, I wouldn't be struggling with this sin in my heart, I wouldn't have family members who are sick, if he cared, he would be here. We're going to look at a story in, in Scripture. It's found in John 11, and it's, it's about a man named Lazarus. A man named Lazarus, and he's sick. 
He's extremely sick, and he's on his deathbed. And Lazarus has two sisters named Mary and Martha, and they both send word to Jesus and say, Jesus, the one who you love is sick. Please come heal him. Please come help us. We need you, Jesus. And Jesus does something extremely remarkable. Jesus purposely delays going. He purposely does not go, and Lazarus dies. And as you can imagine, Mary and Martha are heartbroken. And not only because their, do- their brother has just passed away, but because Jesus didn't come. Jesus didn't come. So after Lazarus died, Jesus decides to go visit the family after he's dead. And when he approaches the house, when he gets close by and Mary finds out, she runs out to meet him. She runs out to meet him, and we're picking up in verse 32, and this is it. It says, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. So Jesus approaches this town. He comes up, and Mary runs out to meet Jesus, and she looks straight into the Son of God's face, the one who created the universe. He created gravity, the trees around him. She runs to the face of Jesus and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you had been here, we wouldn't be in this situation that we're in. What is she saying? She's expressing complete disappointment. She's just been let down because she asked Jesus for something big, and Jesus didn't come through. She says to the Son of God, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. We wouldn't be in this situation. He would still be alive today. We wouldn't be heartbroken. We would not be here, Lord, if you had just showed up. And I can imagine the questions now start to arise inside of her, Lord, if you cared enough. If you cared enough, we wouldn't be where we are right now. If you had been there, just completely disappointment. And how many times do we go through life thinking that God just does not care? We think he's just too distant. He's just too removed from our lives. Maybe we ask him for something and it it didn't work out the way we thought it would. And now we're sitting here wondering, Jesus, are you here? Are Are you next to me? Are you in my situation? Are you just removed from my life? And even, do you care? Do you care at all? How many times do we ask that? And how many times do we, do we allow these thoughts, these, this, this way of thinking to allow it to change who we are, to affect how we think, the way we act, and, and what we think about God, about who He is and how He means to us? How often do we let these thoughts control us? Maybe they're conscious thoughts, maybe they're subconscious, but either way they're there and now they're affecting who we are and we even become bitter to the point where we think, Jesus, you don't care. Jesus, because if you did you would have been there. Sometimes we, we spend our whole life thinking that, and then we look at stories like this, and we think, this just proves exactly everything that I've been thinking. Jesus, you knew he was sick. You knew you could save him, but you didn't go. This wasn't an ability problem. It's not like Jesus is sitting here like, well, I've never healed a man who's close to dying. I don't know if I can do it. I don't want to embarrass myself if it doesn't work. Like, this wasn't an ability problem. Everyone knew Jesus could do it, but he just didn't go. He didn't show up. And now we're sitting here wondering, and Mary and Martha are sitting here wondering, well, why didn't you show up? Why are you removed from me? Why aren't you here? Why are you so distant? So Jesus, he shows up to this grave, and he meets the family. 
And he sees, it says he looks around and he sees the brokenness and the people weeping. He sees the brokenness in everybody's faces and in their lives. And he sees the pain. And the Son of God does something so unexpected. Verse 35 says that Jesus wept. Jesus wept. And this isn't saying like Jesus had a, you know, he had a few tears in his eye. He had to grab a tissue real quick, leave the room, and then, and then come back, and then he was okay. No, it said he, he bitterly wept. He broke down and started bawling in front of everybody. He was weeping. Have you ever walked in on somebody who's cried before? Like, has that ever happened? You walk in, it's awkward, isn't it? Like one, one minute, like everything's okay, you're having a good old time, then all of a sudden somebody's crying, you're like, whoa, what I miss? What's happening? It's awkward. I get super like, whoa, my defenses go down. I'm like, whoa, back up. Calm, your, calm yourself. Okay, I don't want to know about this. I get really awkward when somebody starts crying around me. It, it's weird. And I can imagine that that's how Mary felt this point in time. And there was a, I, I grew up, my entire life, I've been an electrician in my dad's business. And we go all around the county driving from, from job to job. And there was this one day, I was in the van with my partner, Bobby, and we're driving down 590 South. And in front of us is this little red car, little red car. And this car just starts swerving back and forth, left, right. Then it would accelerate and slam on the brakes and just all over the road. And immediately, I'm sure nobody else does this, but I immediately started judging the person in front of me. Like, come on, come on, get it together, buddy. What are you doing? And now I'm starting to think, well, this person's probably drunk. Maybe they're texting and driving. Get off your phone, buddy. Like, you're going to hurt, some- you're going to kill someone. You might kill me. I wouldn't want that. And immediately, the- I- I'm surely I'm the only one who does this, but I started judging this person as we st- were driving. Some of you are like, I, I do that for the most part part every day of my life, and we're driving, and I'm just like, this person is going to kill somebody, so it got to the point where I was like, I got to get past this person, so I, I move over to the next lane, and I zoom past it, and you know, you know that when you drive past somebody like that, you got to look to see who it is, like, you can't just drive past them, like, you got to know what they look like, mm-hmm, I knew it, mm-hmm, and you, so I drove past, and I looked over to the left, and inside the, the car, this little red car, is this girl holding onto the steering wheel with two hands, clenched tight, and her face, she is bawling. And I'm not talking about like tears, like makeup streaming down her face, her hair's a mess. She's screaming at the steering wheel, just grabbing onto this wheel. And I looked over and I was like, every single judgment that I made about this girl, every accusation that I made about this random person I didn't even know, I was just like, oh, because I knew that she was in some type of pain. I don't know what she was crying about, what was going on, but she was just utterly destroyed. And every judgment and every anger, angry thought that I made about her just completely melted down. And I can imagine Mary, she's going up to Jesus and said, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. And maybe now she's looking for a reason as to why he was not there. Jesus, what's your excuse? Why weren't you there? Why didn't you come? Why is Lazarus dead? Why are we in this position that we are now? And if I was here, I'd be looking for some type of reason, just angry at Jesus. And Jesus breaks down and immediately just starts weeping. And I can imagine Mary's like... Just completely taken back. What is he doing? Jesus looked around and he saw the effects of a broken world. He saw the destruction of what sin can do in our lives and death. And he knew that this was not how it was supposed to be. He knew that this was not how things should have been, and it broke his heart. It completely destroyed him. He saw the pain in other people's lives, and it wrecked him. What is he doing here? Jesus is showing that he was never far from them at all. He was never removed from their situation. He didn't just get to escape the consequences or escape the aftermath of what happened. He was there and he experienced every ounce of pain that they felt. He was there and it was real to him just as it was real to them. And he was with them the entire time. He wasn't distant. He wasn't out of the situation. He wasn't out of control. But he was there with them and he got it and he felt it. So what is the point? 
Jesus is closer than you think, and he cares deeper than you know. He's closer than you think, and he cares deeper than you know. Maybe not what Mary was expecting, but he was showing them that he's not removed from this. He didn't get to get out of this. That he felt that with them. He felt the effects of this sinful world with them. And sometimes we don't always know why God will allow some things to happen, why, why things, some things happen, why some things don't. But what we do know is that in every single one of those situations, no matter where you are, what's happening, Jesus is not removed from your situation. He is not far off from where you are. In fact, he is standing there with you and experiencing that deep, deep pain with you. He is not far off. He is closer than you think because he cares deeper than you know. So what is, what is the point of Jesus? Like, like is Jesus' point only to just sympathize with us so we have a cuddle buddy when we're crying? And so Jesus can pat us on the back and say, there, there, I know how you're feeling. I get it. And then that's that. Is that the only point that Jesus is trying to make here? Is that Jesus' only purpose? And the good news is this story doesn't end here. This picks up in verse 39. Jesus says, take away the stone, he said. But Lord said, Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor. He smells, for he has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, of, came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to him, take off the grave clothes and let him go. And Lazarus walked out of the grave. He got up where there was death. Jesus brought life into that situation. Where there was hopelessness, Jesus brought hope. And where there was darkness, Jesus brought light. Lazarus came forth and he raised the dead to life. And he gives life. That's right. Hallelujah. But the good news is that this story still does not end here. Because Jesus was doing so much more than just raising a dead man to life. As if that wasn't enough, right? I've never seen that happen before. I don't know if I'll ever see that happen. But Jesus was doing so much more than just raising a dead man back to life. What Jesus was saying, what he's saying to Mary and Martha, what he's saying to all of us is, in a few weeks' time, I am going to die. And then three days later, I'm going to come back to life. He's foreshadowing what's going to happen in literally two weeks. He's saying, this is going to happen to me. And Jesus, he looks around at all the brokenness, the pain, the sinfulness inside of our lives. And he says, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to take your sin. I'm going to die, come back, and I'm going to breathe life into your heart. I'm going to give you forgiveness, hope, and healing, and breathe that into your life because through his death, he comes to life, and then he gives that life to us. And he's using Lazarus to show it's not just about bringing a dead man to life. He's saying, in a few weeks' time, I am going to be able to give life to every single person on this planet, and I'm going to bring life where there is death. And Mary understood that now. In chapter 12, a few verses later, they're all in the room together, all just hanging out in this one room, and Mary comes up to Jesus with some weird essential oil thing. Anyone a fan of essential oils? I, I don't get them. I don't, I don't know what they're for. My wife loves them. She puts them on me when I have a cold, like puts it all over my head. And I, 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 it might work. It might be her just trying to get rid of me. I don't know. I, I don't know. It's weird. But, but Mary, and I'm sure that's what the disciples were thinking, like, okay, really essential oils right now? So Mary, I'm sorry if you guys love essential oils. Mary's coming, coming up, and she rubs 
essential oils all over Jesus' feet. And this is a really strange type of oil. It was an oil that was used for people who were about to go into a casket if they're dead to help them decompose better. And she starts rubbing it. And Jesus is still alive. She starts rubbing it all over his feet just a few days after this incident. What is she doing? She's preparing Jesus for death. She's preparing Jesus for death. And what she is saying is, I know that you have to die. And I'm ready for you to die because I know after you die, there's going to be life. She wasn't so much worried about Lazarus anymore. She got that it wasn't just about him. It was about what Jesus was about to do, that Jesus was going to bring forgiveness and life into the hearts of millions. And she knew that in order for that to happen, there had to be death so Jesus could bring back life. She knew that was going to happen. It wasn't about Lazarus anymore. It was about who Jesus was and what he was about to do so there could be life. So there could be life. Jesus sees the brokenness in our world. He sees the sins that you struggle with on a daily basis that no matter how many times you try, you can't get rid of. He sees the family members that you have seen sick. And he looks at all of those things and it breaks his heart. It destroys us, destroys him, and he is not removed from those situations. He is not far. He's right there with you, and he experiences that pain with you, and it breaks him, but he doesn't just stop there. He says, I'm going to fix this, and I'm going to die so I can bring forgiveness to your heart so that you can be cleansed of your sin. You can have hope again that there's a hope and a future with me. He is not far off, and the cross proves that he cares about us so deeply. He's closer than you think because he cares deeper than you know, and Jesus proved that on the cross. And the good news is because of the cross, you never have to go through a situation where you feel like Jesus is gone. You don't have to go through a situation where he is gone because Jesus is so close to you by what he did on the cross. And the good news is there is nothing you have to do to earn that. There is no way you can earn that. Jesus doesn't say you have to get to this level. You have to be this good. You have to follow these rules. You have to meet this bar. He doesn't say that. He says, if you would just trust me with your heart, all I'm asking for is to give give me your dead heart. And he says, I will speak life into that again. Because we know that Jesus is closer than we think, and he cares deeper than we know. So let me ask you this. What are the dead parts of your heart where you feel like you need Jesus to resurrect? What are the sins in your life that no matter how hard you try, you can't shake, and not only is it destroying your life, but it's destroying the lives of the people around you? What are the situations that are broken in your family where you need Jesus to speak life into? What are the prayers that you're not praying anymore because you just don't want to be disappointed? You don't want to be let down because if he doesn't give it, he may not be real. What I can encourage you with is because of what Jesus did on the cross... He can speak life into every single one of those situations. He can bring hope and healing and forgiveness, not because of who we are, because of what he did. And all we have to do is just give him, say, Lord, I trust you with my broken heart. I need you because of my broken, broken heart. Because we know that Jesus, he is closer than we think, and he cares deeper that we know. Let's go to Jesus right now. Lord God, we thank you